Hello and welcome to today's video. Now, this one is going to be a bit of an epic. It's almost three hours long, so quite, quite crazy. But it's been six or seven months, maybe even a little bit longer since I've done what I have coined a shunting session. So back in the days when I used to be a bookseller, um, we would have you know, trolley loads of stock turn up and we'd have to shunt all the books along to fit everything in so everything was in order. And uh, that's a similar sort of situation to what I've got today in that I've got lots and lots of new acquisitions. I've got a new bookcase that's come in. I've got stuff that's been pulled for various videos and um, it all needs to sort of go back in location and have a bit of a bit of a sort out because as you can see it's not exactly looking very neat and tidy there's lots of stacks on top of books and look at that, all, all new acquisitions that have come my way in the last sort of six seven months or so so i'd like to get this looking a little bit better so that is uh, going to be the subject of today's video loads more shunting so i've got huge sections where i have to go through my entire Penguin and my entire Pan book collection. So those are like big swathes of um, of this video. But interspersed with that, and starting off in fact right now, is some of my smaller collections which needed sorting out. So this particular one at the start here is my Ed McBain. So the reason I'm sorting these out is these have come off a bookcase recently because um, I've in the office where my wife works, um, I've been able to squeeze in another sort of five or six shelf bookcase which um, I picked up from Ikea a couple of weeks ago so that one's assembled and what I thought I'd do I have actually started putting some of my books into short-term storage so they're not on display but they are accessible so I've just popped them into some comic boxes and uh, the first sort of lot of that I've done has been the uh, the non-fiction star Trek books, the sort of early sort of pre pocket book era, so the pre 1980 81 Star Trek books, and um, I've done detailed videos on all of those now, so I'm not going to need to recover them. And um, I gave them one final clean on my other channel, um, sort of my dedicated book cleaning channel, and that was it. So they're, they're now going to sort of go away, and it was like two comic boxes worth of books. So they're sort of packed away now, and I will do that with some of my other collections um, if I need the space. But thankfully, um, I've now got a whole bookcase which I can take some stuff down from uh, sort of the loft area, which is where my library is at the moment, um, and some of the stuff I've not been able to shelve properly, and uh, and get it on these this brand new bookcase. So that's what we're looking at now. So. I sorted all the Edmund Baines to make sure they're all in order because they're a little bit um, out of order. And um, the way I have mine shelving, I've got the smaller American ones first and then the, the later British ones. Now, my Edmund Bain assorted in publication order. So that's what you're seeing is my entire Edmund Bain collection with the exception of the Penguin Edmund Bain first, which got published in the 1960s. And they're within my main Penguin run. Um, there are some fairly early pans there, but because I've got a dedicated Ed McBain collection, they're not with my tail end ISBN pan books, which uh, once again we will see a little bit later on. In fact, right towards the very end, because uh, that's an area which I'm slowly branching into, which is sort of 70s and early 80s pan science fiction because um, I do really, really like it. And I've got a, a nice run of the 60s. Well, as you'll see quite soon, um, I've got a video coming up which concentrates on my pan SF and horror. So this is just some of the piles that still sort of need sorting, some of the nondescript Penguin series that I think can go down into the office because I don't really need access to them. Um, this is sort of the state of uh, my Collins crime, my Albatross books there. You see they're really overflowing. And um, these... I want to get all these books into order now and um, expand the shelves a bit so they've got a bit more room to breathe and I've got a bit more room for new acquisitions. So I've decided, as well as the Ed McBain's, I'm going to take down my entire Albatross collection because that's another publisher where I have covered the books a couple of times on my main channel, but most recently I covered them when I was asking the question, were these the Penguin Books blueprint, which they you know, definitely were. Um, and I've also covered them on my cleaning channel. So my Albatross collection expanded 
Well, it probably doubled in the last year, and that was mainly down to uh, um, a couple of octogenarians, a couple of old OAPs who used to be teachers in mainland Europe. And they bought these not when they were coming out in the 1930s, but they did buy them in the 1940s and 50s when these were still very plentiful on the second hand racks. And um, they amassed quite, quite a collection. And um, although I didn't buy everything that they had, they let me cherry pick all the ones I didn't have. So it was absolutely fantastic. The sad part was they only had a handful of crime titles, which are by very, you know, by a mile, those are the rarer albatross titles. So I, I did get two Agatha Christie's off them, but they're both absolutely hammered. But I was still pleased to get any crime because that's the uh, the tough ones with albatross. So as you can see with the actual shelving here, I just have them in stacks, like three stacks, and then a row of books in front. And that these ones, these bookcases you're looking at, these white ones, they're from Ikea. Now, pre-pandemic, or even during the pandemic, these books were about, these bookcases were just £19 each. They were a veritable bargain, and I did buy several. Um, they're not, they're, in fact, they're nowhere near as hard-wearing hard as like the Billy range of bookcases, which are fantastic, but they're cheap. But since the pandemic and, you know, the prices, uh, there is inflation, of course, so the prices have gone up and these are coming in at £26 a bookcase now, which I still believe is pretty good value for money, in all honesty. But they don't really handle a lot of weight. And I, these albatrosses are really, really heavy paperbacks, so just down to the time that they were made. If you ever pick up an albatross, it weighs twice as much as a, a penguin. Um, and... Consequently, the uh, shelves were a bit bowed. So the two, thankfully, these IKEA bookcases, you can flip the shelves over with the white edges out. And um, over time, once the bookcases are, are back merchandised again, you don't really notice that the books are the shelves are a bit bent. And over time, they will uh, level out again. So uh, I took the opportunity to do that as well while I was emptying. But at the moment, I've got the Ed McBain's boxed up. I've got the Albatrosses boxed up. <clears throat> And uh, we'll be filling that empty bookcase downstairs. So that's a load of digit new editions, which I need to get sorted. Um, that shelf there, there's more digit behind it. And then there's early British publishers that are non, non penguin. And my new Muth and Six Pennies are there. There's my Toucan paperbacks. And then uh, American, uh, mainly American, with a shelf of Foursquare in New English Library. There's all the, the door science fiction. There's my Dell map backs. And that's um, Hutchinson pocket library and some more american stuff unfortunately um i didn't really get a chance to sort that little corner out I, I ran out of time this video itself has taken a week of filming on and off so you'll see me in different sort of t-shirts and stuff because it's just taken so long to actually pull together and um, this is just having a look at the pan situations and lots of books on top you see those books that are on their sides that's because they're new acquisitions or they've been pulled out because i filmed certain videos and this, those books need to go back in plus i've got a box and a half of science fiction and horror to go back in as well so uh, you'll see a mega pan shunting towards the end a little bit of pos there and um, that shelf there is my james bond books which won't be touched at all except i've got one odd one to file away there but all the sort of numbered series and then towards the end you see i've got all those piles of books on the side there which are new acquisitions and then my pan books which are isbn only are at the very end So I just wanted to show you uh, what it was looking like before we uh, started tackling all those pans. So here we are downstairs. This is the new bookcase now, and it's in situ. So I just, it just fitted literally by a hair's breadth. So I filled in the Ed McBain's. Uh, this is from the bottom, and um, this is the, uh, the start of the Albatross books going back into situ. But I only took one box down and I had um, basically about two boxes worth of albatross books so they're uh, being loaded up now into comic boxes now I find comic boxes quite easy to transport books um, so if for example I'm filming 
a dedicated video on a particular publisher, I shall try and load them into this comic box in order. Then I can easily get them down and uh, to the studio where I can um, film my dedicated videos. I do love my Albatross books, they are great. Ultimately, I am uh, looking to have a dedicated room for my, uh, well, a dedicated library, basically. Um, but I need to wait until the boys moved out from home. <laughs> and who knows when that's going to be, so he's currently doing his A-levels, so it's going to be a while yet. off and out of the way. And as you can see, those Collins books were, uh, that shelf was absolutely packed. It definitely needed more room. Of course, they didn't just publish crime books, which are the green ones there. There are some other series as well, like the yellow ones are westerns, and um, there's some which they class as thrillers, which are in the uh, like the cerise purple colouring. But basically, I had to sort of strip down what I had on the bookcases so I could actually get to them, and then file the new acquisitions back in because I picked up an awful lot from Morris at Zardos Books. Um, Morris had recently, when I visited with um, my friend Steve, uh, another YouTuber called The Outlaw Bookseller, um, Morris mentioned that he just received a collection of 4,000 Agatha Christie books across all publishers and I guessed that he'd had some Collins Crime ones, which he had, which I was able to grab, all the ones that I didn't have. And I also picked up some of the American, really early American ones from Avon and Pocket Books, and they're all in first printing, so I was really pleased about that. I also, I think it was from Morris, I also found one of the Canadian Collins um, crime titles, which I was really pleased about, because there's five of those for Agatha Christie, and I picked up uh, one of those off Morris, which was, which was brilliant. Probably the most common one, but I don't really care. It's just nice sometimes with these things to have an example. And uh, there's no way um, I'll ever be able to get all the Canadian um, Collins. In fact, I think my friend Gary Lavisi, also on YouTube, he showed he shared his collection on his channel of the Canadian Collins, and um, he said there's no one no collector that he knows of that's actually got the full set and there's only about 250 they are that scarce i think in total i've got maybe five um because they really rarely turn up in the uk very very scarce indeed so now i've basically got the uh the, the crime club titles here um sorted enough so i can start pulling out and filing back in um the, the various numbered ones now the coins crime club are numbered which is quite handy um but sometimes the number isn't obvious um the easy way to tell particularly on the early ones is that they do list the books the book titles and the numbers on the back very very similar to penguin and um you could almost say these were as close to Penguin books without actually being Penguin books. Um, and, you know, Collins obviously thought Penguin were going to be a huge competitor and they didn't want to miss out on this booming paperback market. So, and, you know, they started just a year or two later after the Penguins, and I think the early ones are in the Collins Crime Club. They are fantastic, and they're, because they're all crime, it's an eminently collectible list, and uh, I, I really do like them. Um, once you get a few together, you do start getting the bug, and I was lucky to put to get like a, a starter collection um, a few years back, about four or five years ago, which um, really got me collecting these with Ernest. And uh, if you ever get the chance to pick up an early one, you you just love them. They're very much like the early penguins or the albatrosses. They're really well made. The books feel nice and weighty in the hands, and ultimately you're reading some absolutely classic golden age crime, which is uh, is quite a treat, you know? It 
if you are trying to collect these in first edition you've got a real headache on your plan on your hands now i haven't got a full list i don't think i have anyway where it details which printing is which so for example um, the very first book in the collins crime club is murder on the orient express a brilliant title but the first collins printing of that is i believe it's like the eighth printing of that title so printings one to seven were in hardback and printing number eight and they mark it as number eight was the first paperback copy and it lists the first six Collins Crime Club titles on the back of the dust wrapper and of the back of the book so consequently unless you really know your subject you could go into a bookshop and they wouldn't know if they had a first printing or not because it's really really difficult to tell without sort of going through the reference so the bigger authors people like Agatha Christie for example all the different printings that they've worked out what's what so I don't know say the five little pigs the first Collins printing might be the fourth printing overall um, so inside the Collins books they won't have printed in hardback one to seven then uh, first Collins paperback printing you know such and such a date they just don't do them like that so consequently it makes them very very difficult to identify first editions and there are ways to tell so and also this was one of those weird lists a bit like pam books where books got reissued later on with a different number and a different price so i think something like i don't know five little pigs i've got three copies in collins i've got the original first release which is in you know fairly early then i've got a release that came towards the tail end of the war which is much thinner but with a different number and then i've got a third release which was published as a services edition so as i said it's a tricky publisher to try and keep on top of the only way i've done it is to um after you've got a collection of them together you sort of get a feel for if it's if it's if it's got the right adverts and stuff inside um and you just you know when you put it next to the numbers either side of it you get to know if it's a first or not so um it's just something that comes with experience but as i said a, a part, there's like a vintage paperbacks website but it hasn't been updated for quite a while but he has got um i think he's i think he's got an almost definitive list but it doesn't of the titles but it doesn't go into all the different printings of which ones are which so quite how useful that is i don't know but um you know it, it, there is something that exists on that i think it's just called you know vintage paperbacks something like that and it, it you'll you'll know it um because it just concentrates on the uh the british predominantly pre-war paperbacks that's all they really cover on there but anyway bit of a bit of a tricky old job but i got the collins stuff all sorted and now i'm loading it into the boxes in numerical order so that i can take them downstairs and put them on the uh, on the new bookcase because this is going to correct this particular bookcase we're doing now that we're emptying is going to end up being re-merchandised i'm going to have some uh, i'm going to have a whole brand new shelf to pan books which i really need and i'm going to shuffle some other stuff around um while we do it so um ultimately at the end of this i've still got a couple of book a couple of shelves spare for some expansion and i'm going to carry on um sorting out my american uh, paperbacks because um, they're in a not massive disarray but certain collections i'm going to peel out of my main american run um, so I've got like um, I'm getting quite a run together now of early Ballantine books and in fact I've got another couple um, coming from the States a couple more of the um, best American short story books from the 1960s which I'm really pleased to get because they're tough to find well I don't think they're ever sold in, in Britain at all um, edited by Martha Foley um, so I've got a couple of those on their way and uh, thankfully being um, assisted with that by one of my uh, a patreon early patreon supporters uh, chris over in the states he's uh he's boxing those up um, i'm able to order some from america because the postage is ridiculous but i'm ordering them um from ebay or oh, i'm asking chris to get them for me and he's just sort of putting a box together which he'll send over um uh, later on so uh, what a good egg eh? what a good guy um and that saves me masses of postage so um something to consider if you can find someone in the states who's willing to do that um for me it's going to be a way that i can pick up some uh some stuff that you just can't find in the uk so these ones here this is the later uh, collins crime club titles 
And that yellow, you can see just a hint of that yellow one there. That's one of their westerns. Only got one of those. And they did some uh, non-fiction. And they did a separate series with John Goldsworthy. And I've got a little run of... Um, there's a Goldsworthy. And I've got a little run of um, Services Editions. That wavy line one there is uh, Collins india edition i believe and i also have um, an indian services edition which is incredibly rare so um just one odd one of those but they go for a fortune like a couple of hundred quid i couldn't believe it when i came across that one so that was pretty lucky and there we are so i'm making the most of the space because um well that's what you've got to do but i have left on this bookcase there is enough room to uh to do a little bit of expansion but i haven't picked up any collins crime club uh, for a few months now but i would imagine next time i go back to morris's in zardos books all you need is books warehouse he's got a he's probably got a couple of hundred there which i need to go through again with a fine tooth comb and see if there's any more early editions that I might be missing now that I've updated all my lists. Speaking of lists, um, one of the uh, the key things I like to do is keep all my collection um, in my Google Drive. So I can access that on my phone, uh, basically, and you can download it offline. So as long as you've got um, your phone on you, um, you've always got, or I've always got my list of books that I need. And I list all my books um, by publisher, so I can just dial into a particular publisher. And I've something like the Collins ones here. I've got the whole lot listed with the printings. And if it's a book that's in a bit tatty condition, I just put next to it UG, Upgrade, which means if I come across the book that I've already got, but it's a nice copy, I'll pick it up again as an upgrade. So that first shelf there is now completely full. But rather than put books on top, I'm giving the uh, Collins Crime Club a whole another stack um there we are that's one of the services editions there it's got like a a splash across it quite quite nice those they did do an awful lot of services editions. i think about 50 so there's no way i'm ever going to get them all but once again it's nice to have a few as an example Most of the early ones came in dust wrappers uh, like penguin ones from the period they're quite quite uh, fragile Some of these might be better off taking the dust wrappers off and putting them in my big stack of dust wrappers just for safekeeping, really. There's that uh, Indian one there. Only one I've ever, ever seen of those. Never seen another one. And I can't even remember where I picked that one up, but very, very scarce. Lovely. One thing you do notice when you handle really old paperbacks like that is that they just they can literally crumble um, in your hands. So you do need to be careful. The only real way that I'm going to sort that out is by bagging everything up, and I just don't want to do that. So now I'm popping uh, my albatrosses. So I'm not leaving any extra room for the Collins because I just have when I've got enough new acquisitions, I just do another new shunting session. So until then, I'm just going to fill up every little nook and cranny to maximize my uh my space basically and that's what i'm doing here now by putting the albatross books in in numerical order straight after the collins as i said all the series that i'm putting in this uh bookcase downstairs is pretty much titles that i've covered in, in quite a bit of detail i've had i haven't had all the collins christie's out uh, so all the collins crime club out that recently but i did do a special on all the agatha christie's which is about half that collection so i don't feel the need to do them and as i said i've already covered the albatrosses um you know in the last 12 months so they're not going to be uh, a focus unless i get a big collection in or something like that so there is the bookcase fully merchandised now so some big huge format books at the top then we got the collins crime club tail end of those into the albatross books then we got the tail end of albatross and i brought down some of the british stuff my mutant six pennies my uh saint books and then some of those nondescript penguin series the penguin scores penguin biology penguin science ed mcbain um photo novels and uh, the alfred hitchcock three investigators so some little series that have all been covered in detail right 
<laughs> so now we're moving on um well i just want to show you the pan stuff first of all so i've been through i've had to um pull out all the penguin uh, sorry, all the pan horror and science fiction and um i've gone off and filmed that video so i've got all those books to go back as well as all those new acquisitions so i've tried to put some of it back in but look i've got a box and a half there of uh vintage pan that's all going to need sorting out um, it's a bit of an epic job to put it all back in numerical order um, but look at the mess of my penguin collection so that's similar um, the shells are a bit doolally the reason this is looking a bit rough is because I've taken off the penguin travel and all my penguin modern classics so it's a, this is another day or two later and um, uh, I've kept because I do film in the loft I've kept a spotlight up there and I've just dragged up my uh, my camera and tripods so I can just record this as we uh, as we go through it so the first job really is get rid of all these um, uh, nice penguin mugs get them safely to one side take off all the beer towels and I really need to do a number on this because my I don't like it when my penguins are looking this rough but there's a reason behind it as I said I've uh, I've had to uh, film the complete of my complete collection of penguin modern classics which i absolutely loved i really do enjoy the penguin modern classics and they're still fantastic today and also for the first time ever i pulled all my penguin travel books out the cerise ones and that was fantastic to see those all together um and of course because i only need four books under 1000 and none of those are travel ones i could confidently say this was the complete vintage penguin travel and i had a fair batch of the ones that came after 1000 so although it's not every single travel book it's virtually them all that penguin ever published um as a dedicated travel title bar a few odd uh, forces book club ones which i didn't think to include but i sort of wish i had now but there you go <laughs> so there we are just uh, clearing off some of the clutter some of the uh, extra memorabilia that ends up on the shelves because i've basically got nowhere else to put it and uh, I am very much looking forward to uh, getting my library so I can get these pans all out without having to double up any of my books. The dream is that I can have all the walls um, floor to ceiling bookcased without needing to double up. And then I'm going to have a center island, um, which will be back to back bookcases for any sort of overflow with a nice, um, nice reclining chair right in the middle of the room. That is the dream. And that's going to be purpose built just as soon as, uh, as soon as my boy uh, leaves home but he's only almost 17 he's right in the middle of his A-level so it's not going to happen for a few years yet but uh, when it does I am looking forward to that and I reckon I'd, I'll have enough to fill a room <laughs> probably more than one room but that's the plan to get all the paperbacks out I think it'd be fantastic that's unless we move house of course which uh, you never know So now the way I've got my penguins laid out, so this first shelf here goes back to penguin number one, uh, up to about, I don't know, penguin 100 or something like that. And um, I have to just, and anything that I've pulled out for either of those reasons, like early uh, modern classics or um, penguin travel just has to go back in. So you can see the little clutch of penguin travels up there and they're the ones that need to uh, refiled so uh, that's what I'm doing here now so it's funny most of the penguins I've been picking up lately um, you may have seen on the channel I visited um, a SF specialist dealer uh, called a chap called uh well bob and he's in dorset so we've we've sort of coined him dorset bob basically and um bob has um he's been a book collector stroke dealer for over 30 years and that's not his main profession he's just you know a very very keen uh, book collector and really knowledgeable on his subjects as well um and he has reached that stage in his life where he's got a room he's got his own library which is all floor to ceiling sf hardbacks it's fantastic 
He's also got his office, which is uh, floor to ceiling paperbacks and pulps. Uh, but he's got a massive collection of spares, and um, because he's collected so long, and he's you know he's travelled the world, he's been to all the big book fairs right round the world. Um, he's constantly upgraded his stuff, and now that he's decided to downsize a bit, the sort of stuff which is going into his spares collection, stuff that um, you know people can buy. It's just the the condition is literally astonishing, and um, he's got some great stories about how he came across some of this stuff as well, um, and uh, well, they're just brilliant. So I've been filling in a lot of um, Penguin books from the 1960s into the early 1970s with absolutely mint, immaculate, almost like file copies. Um, they're pristine and read editions of um, uh, like J.G. Ballard titles and things like that and, the, and all the other Penguin science fiction authors so I've really um, done well lately with sort of 60s books um, obviously I'm not going to be picking up a lot of early stuff because as I said I only need four to complete the first thousand um, and I, I suppose I will start on the second thousand in earnest once I've got those first four but I've just been unlucky um, at least two of those four that I need I saw last year um, one of them three times and I didn't I, once again for various reasons I just um, I didn't end up getting them you know I had the money there available but they were either dealers which were doing draws out of a hat um, which was really really frustrating because you know if you don't get picked you don't get the chance um, sometimes um, other collectors stroke dealers got lucky and then decided to sell the books on which cheesed me off absolutely no end I can tell you that and has created a few ripples within the penguin cl uh, collecting community because lots of people know exactly what was happening and uh, it really did um, sour the collecting scene um, I was immensely cheesed off about that and um it, it you know it did sort of you know it put me off collecting penguins for a while it's as simple as that i mean ultimately um you know whoever is selling the books it's up to them to sell them it's there's no law against it you know um it's just the way it's been done and, and certain dealers were so out of touch with the pricing um, and I think feedback has been given uh, from various sources and then there was other stuff going on uh, as well within the penguin world which really really annoyed me so that you wouldn't believe and I'm not going to go into it publicly because that's not what I do but suffice to say when I spoke to other collectors they were equally cheesed off I mean unbelievably so and um, as I said it's created a few sort of ripples through the the penguin collecting community and we'll see what happens in the long run about that and if things actually start to change but um, I think this is one of the reasons why um, uh, the, the penguin collector society has never really surpassed 500 members and um, there's so much that that doesn't get done and um i know their aim is not to have a like a massive membership but um i don't know i, I just don't think the right things are happening and uh it's a shame really um but anyway if you want plenty of penguin content there's plenty of it on my channel and you only got to look at the backlist of over 50 plus penguin dedicated videos on my channel looking at all aspects of all the series so uh hopefully i scratch that itch certainly from the feedback i get and the uh thousand tens of thousands of views that the channels get every month that's the best exposure that vintage paperbacks could possibly get i would think anyway enough about my uh, my annoyance with recent happenings in the world of penguin collecting um i just don't care i'm over it now but it certainly annoyed me at the time and uh, we'll you know, it has changed my sort of collecting habits recently, and I've been enjoying collecting other stuff. In all honesty, you know, um, and certainly the stuff the, that late '60s stuff I was getting from uh, Dorset Bob is fantastic. So I'm uh, really, really pleased with that. Got a few uh, book trips planned as well. Um, so the. Uh, I do have another trip to Dorset Bob's planned. I need to fit in a trip to Morris at Zardos. There is the London Paperback Show coming up um, in London. 
in I believe July so I'm going along to that one I'm going to be filming that one I might even uh, be helping Bob uh, run his store because he took the, it's basically the, the, the show is already a sell out so there's no dealers tables available whatsoever um, but I'm going to be helping Bob uh, probably travel up with him and um, I will be there and obviously I'm going to be filming it I'm going to interview the dealers who are there as well and try and interview um, uh, collectors and maybe fans of the channel so if you're going to be there do give me the heads up and come along and we can uh, we can put you in the video because I think or I reckon it could even be a series of videos looking at the London paperback show um, it's tied next door to an ephemera affair as well and I do intend um, covering that as well um, but since I'm going up with Bob as a dealer I will have access really early so hopefully I'll be able to um, really cover some good stuff um, while we're there Sounds like a bit of a helicopter going in overhead. So in the space of three hours recording this non-stop audio, uh, we are going to hear the odd car, probably the odd seagull, because uh, that's what they like to do where I live. And, um, and uh, yeah, the odd, uh, the odd train going by and what have you in the distance. But yeah, I'm very much looking forward to uh, to some of the shows I've got lined up. Oh, in fact, this very Sunday I'm off to uh, the Shepton Mallet Toy Fair, which is one I haven't been to for at least 10 years. Um, so that should be good fun. Um, ironically, the last time I was up there, I did actually find some books. Um, so there you go. You never know. So that's the first two shells of the, uh, the Penguin book sorted. And... Uh, you notice I put these um, beer towels on top, so you don't really see them nowadays. But back in the day, you used to be at a, you would go to a bar, and there would be like, bar towels or beer towels, and the bar person would pour your pint, and then they'd uh, put them on the uh, on the towel there to soak up any sort of drips that were coming down the side of the glass. Now, as a kid, I always used to collect the um, collect stroke pinch the beer towels, and um, ended up with quite a quite a collection of them. I got. Um, a, a girlfriend of mine this is you know, 30 odd years ago she sewed them all together and I made a really cool beach towel inevitably that itself got nicked when I was sort of in the sea because it was a really good one so I wish I still had that but what I have got is this little run of beer towels left and um, I use them throughout my collection on my sort of oldest books because just to stop the sort of the dust any extra dust settling on them on my other channel, I am systematically working my way through my entire book collection, and I'm cleaning it all. So I'm going through every single book. I'm checking to see if there's any uh, pencil markings inside, that sort of thing. And um, on the Penguins, um, I think I'm up to... Oh, I can't really remember. I think I've done about the first six or seven hundred. Um, so I've still got loads to go. Um, but it's amazing, and they do... You know, I, I like repair spines, glue bits of bits of bits of spine back together, and I um I use a like a soft rubber, turn any pages that are back, and also while I'm going along, I make a note of anything that's low grade. So, in a lot of cases, particularly in the early days of collecting penguin, I would just have the books in literally any condition to fill a number, and um, over time, I intend to upgrade them, obviously. So, just getting the camera sorted there because we're now looking at the most fragile period of Penguin book publishing, which is the war years. So, as you can see instantly, these do not exactly look a million dollars. And that is because the books are so, so thin. And um, all of these are quite pricey. All of them are difficult to get your hands on these days. And when you do find them, they're usually in a right state because of when they were published. So uh, consequently, if you see any sort of Penguin books between 350 and uh, 490, I would definitely recommend picking them up in pretty much any condition simply for their scarcity. So here we are. So I'm going to try and uh, file away some of the, uh, the, 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 the crime titles. But these are quite, quite delicate to deal with. And um, I would say I've probably bagged about 20% of these now because they're either super fragile, very, very expensive, 
or they're in such nice condition I don't want to get the slightest mark on them because they're almost like pristine but super rare and I do have a few in that sort of state so I'm being quite careful and filing in the, the books um, as best I can basically Sounds like the helicopter is coming in overhead and maybe someone has the audacity to mow a lawn. I think they go cheap personally. But I'll try and I'll try and talk through it and give give you a bit more commentary. <laughs> but I think any collector will tell you that the, the toughest books to find are always going to be wartime ones. The four that I'm missing from the first thousand are all wartime ones. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what price you offer. If the books aren't out there to be found and they're just sitting inside collections, there's nothing you can really do. Um, uh, you know, the, the phrase ambulance chaser has, has turned up and um, it's a case where collections come on the market when someone dies and uh, the the family or even the person whose collection it was has said yep phone this person or phone that person and just sell it to them uh, or get them to sell it on your behalf um, and that's mainly when collections surface these days so most of the prominent penguin collector society um, founders now are, are no longer with us sadly um, and their collections have ended up in the hands of, of various dealers throughout the UK and you know I usually get a few from each one so it's almost like we're all just temporary custodians of this stuff aren't we um, but that tends to be the way um, you know that if you're going to complete a collection you just need to be lucky uh, as I said you know, there seems to be this trend of lucky dips now, which, you know, it's just ridiculous, really. Um, and, um, well, you either get lucky or you don't. But as I said, I only need four, and that's still, you know, it'd be fantastic if one day I can complete the collection. Uh, I'm sure I will one day, but uh, until then, there's plenty more fun to be had collecting other stuff. So these are in the 300s that we're doing now, the very Telen 290s 300s. So I know uh, any collector will tell you that, you know, picking up new penguin acquisitions, particularly when you're first starting, is not that difficult to do. Um, and if you're looking, if you're happy to collect books post 1000 or even post 500, you can pretty much get all of those without too much trouble. So uh, consequently, your only real limit is your space that you've got to, um, the space that you've got to actually store them. And I have a few little slips and a few odd books fall on the floor like then, but inevitable when you've got so many books to deal with. And these are really, really thin little volumes, as you can see. But I'm making the most of the space because, as I said, I've only got four to go in this little period, so um, I can confidently fill all the uh, shelves up. I don't need to leave loads of room for expansion. Yeah, I didn't realize that with all this work it was going to end up as a three hour video I mean <laughs> that's it's not a record I think the longest video I ever put up was about five hours but that was like a compilation video um, this is you know all sort of original content but uh, if I'd have done the final bits of the American stuff and that it would have ended up about four videos and I, I wanted to get it up um, this coming Friday so I just ran out of time really but um, it's okay I'll try and um, when I do get around to sorting that stuff out I'll um, I'll try and film that as like a mini shunting session maybe
but I do uh, do enjoy these sessions, although they're um, they can be quite a bit of work, um, and they're made extra difficult because I'm actually filming the whole process. Um, they are quite satisfying when you're uh, sliding in numbers, particularly um, when you're collecting for the first time and you're filling in a little number and it, and it fills like the complete run. That is uh, a great feeling as a collector. So that's that wall of wartime penguin filled. Now I'm going to do a little run in front now. With the wartime ones, it is quite difficult to spot the numbers in that, but um, most of my wartime ones, I make a point. I generally try not to pick them up unless the number is quite legible that's one of my little bugbears with with books but sometimes you don't have a choice so i think a couple of them i had to look up because i didn't know what the uh i couldn't quite see the number and i wanted to put everything back in in, in perfect numerical order The helicopter hasn't given up, and neither has the uh, the guy mowing the lawn. <laughs> How dare they! Blimmin' cheek, I say. There we are. So, got a few more travel books here that need sliding in. Yeah, that was one of the ones off the top of my head I couldn't remember the Penguin series number so I just grabbed my phone out and there's a great great site which I'm not sure if you're aware it exists it's called um, well you can look it up under Penguin First Editions and um, just go to that website and um, type in either in the search box or they've broken it down into Penguin books 1 to 100 with every book um, listed numerically and uh, it's a great great resource for the penguin collector and so um, do head there and I was easily able to look up that book's particular number There we are, so uh, job done. Found the penguin number and able to uh, slide it in now. So that's good news. Yeah, I'd be interested to know um, if you fancy me doing a th sort of a themed one again. I mean, I could pull, I guess I could pull out all like, the penguin crime pre-1000, for example. Um, although I am missing three. I have now got all the penguin fiction. Uh, which is good news. I've got you know all, all the um, all the penguin plays and that, but the other series are a bit more minor, aren't they? Um, I think the crime war will make a great video, but as I said, I am missing still three of them. Um, so I could always put pictures of them up, I suppose, because there are people who just collect penguin crime. Like there are people who just collected the penguin travel or say penguin science fiction, which is uh, there's a great website uh, devoted to penguin SF. Um, online which is uh, recommended but there we are that's one of the very toughest shelves done because the books are so so f thin and fragile um, it was just uh, a bit of a challenge that particular shelf and uh, but it's full of absolute rarities in the world of penguin book collecting so uh, you know I treat it with the reverence that it deserves should we say <laughs> And a couple more beer towels across the top. A 
lovely. I get them as flat as possible. Um, I'm not sure if I put the the mugs back yet. Oh, I do. Yeah. So um, I do love the penguin mugs. I believe I've got every one that was ever released because I was in the book game when they were released, and um, I just I just picked them all up, and thankfully I could get them at a cost price or less. So that was pretty cool. I made a point of getting everyone that I could get my hands on. They're great. I don't know what they go for now. I think you can still buy most of them, but a few of them I think have been dropped. Um, and I was gutted that they never produced a mug for Day of the Triffids, my, you know, my all-time favourite uh, novel. It's a bit of a shame that that never, never happened. I'm certain it would have sold well. I sent the. Uh, I sent my feedback back to say, look, you've got to do Day of the Triffids, but it never happened. <laughs> a couple of odd ones which ended up going slightly out of place, so I uh, had to rejig it at the last minute. Easily done, you see, no one's infallible. Yes, it's been a long old time since, uh, or it seems like a long time since I picked up anything decent vintage-wise. It really does, uh, but, you know, vintage penguin-wise. Picked up a few little um, upgrades this year uh, so far, but not many. Um, I did pick up a nice spare copy of um, Half Mast Murder, um, uh, but I'd moved that one on, sold it on to another collector. Uh, quite a nice rare wartime edition. Right, so this next shelf, I've got a little stool which I keep up in the uh, in the library here, and um, it's just the right height for this, so I can do this one actually sat down rather than stood up. And uh, thankfully now the books get a little bit more robust, as you can see, because we're uh, the early ones will still be quite fragile, but we're going to be looking at books between sort of 460, 470, and uh, 570 to 600. So I can just put these these ones in front, just to the left of me, in in little stacks, and then I can uh, file away the uh, the travel and the Penguin Modern Classics fairly easily. I've almost got everything to hand, but not quite everything. <laughs> so that's my pile of um, travel books that need filing away for this sort of particular area of the collection. But I do end up going back and uh, rejigging the entire first 3,000 penguins that I've got in my collection, because I told you I got quite a lot of new editions for the 60s stuff with the Penguin SF, so uh, you will see those as well, which is super cool. Sounds like the helicopter's uh, flown away now, uh, but I can still hear uh, a lawnmower in the in the distance. But that's fine. 
it's that time of year really where we have that heavy rain then it's really sunny and it just makes your garden go mental and uh, that's the same with all the sort of the public uh, areas as well so I think it's um, it's council workers uh, having to do some mega mega lawn mowing around the area <laughs> So quite quite easy now to file in the uh, the books that are out of position because they've been you know taken out for those dedicated videos. So all nice and straightforward. And uh, this particular bookcase is at a great height. You know, as I can work on, work on it at stool level, as it were. So uh, it's all cool. to uh, put any additions in. squeezing the last little bit of space and a room for just one odd one on the end and then I can go back to those piles to the left of me and uh, do the books that were sat in front of that, those piles so that's how I maximize my space and it's the same principle with whatever size bookcase you've got it's just I'm quite lucky in that the uh, these big thick oh these are really ancient IKEA bookcases uh, these fit four like rows of um, four piles of uh, paperbacks perfectly and the new IKEA bookcases fit about three perfectly so uh, they work out really well so one thing I've not done this year so far is um, travel to other bookshops and do any bookshop tours um, so I am going away with my wife she's got some work to do in and around sort of north devon barnstable sort of way um so i'm going to be um doing the bookshops around there um towards the end of this current month so look out for that i don't know if there'll be enough to film but i'm hoping that there will be um to do all the shops in and around that neck of the woods um honiton's usually quite good and uh, that's fairly near to me and there's like three second-hand bookshops as well as numerous charity shops and uh, like you know if you go on a, a hot summer's day there's usually some street stalls as well so um, last time I went there I actually did all right so I, would, I wouldn't mind doing a Honiton trip at one point and I might do Exeter there's not so much in Exeter anymore um, there's quite a good Oxfam bookshop which and the person in there knows about collectible paperbacks so they tend to not disregard them um, and um, some good stuff's come out of there um, which I've seen lately so uh, um, last time I went there I bought I don't know about 10, 10 uh, nice cheap paperbacks a couple of quid each you don't mind that from a charity shop do you so uh, there might be some stuff there
it's just all about having the time to fit these uh, fit these trips in whilst doing all the other stuff on the channel now because I'm filming this in the loft as you can I've only got one spotlight up there when I'm in the studio I've got two spotlights permanently set up and they sort of flood the table which I work on so the lighting's usually pretty good um, but in the loft it's a little bit patchy I've got spotlights up there as well which were installed when I converted it into the library but at the same time um, you know because of the way you know the camera's set up in the tripod it's not always ideal lighting so bear with me for that it's not you know this isn't 4k or anything but it is as good as i could get it at the time and there we are so we're we're through the first third of it we've already done an hour and if you're still with me well done i hope you're finding this interesting I hope these sorts of videos, these shunting videos, do give you an idea of um, perhaps what it's like to have a big book collection and also how to store it. That's the, that's the big thing. I mean, it really that really can be an issue. Um, you know, over the years I've had purges and I've got rid of bits from my collection, but I tend, the last sort of 10 plus years, I've not tended to get rid of books. I've tended to get rid of toys. Uh, old you know vintage toys because they take up so so much room um, comics as well I've tried to thin out comics and magazines because in a lot of cases I've got them digitally or I can access them digitally and um, they just take up so much space and uh, toys are especially uh, they especially eat up um, loft space. I know a few collectors and they've put stuff in the loft and they literally can't get into it now because it's full of boxes of toys. Well, that's no good. Um, you know, I've got toys that I've had for decades that I'm not enjoying and they're not out on display and I think, well, what's the blooming point of having it? So, you know, I think sooner rather than later I'm going to get rid of them. It's as simple as that because there's just no point keeping some of this stuff. But my books is something that I hope to uh, keep as long as possible because, you know, when I retire, I want to do lots of reading. And uh, there's lots of books I've still yet to ever read. And lots of books um, that are my favourites that I want to reread. So I'll get round to it all eventually. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to be a burden to my family should I die or when I die I should say so before that happens I hope to uh, I'll uh, try and dispose of my collection so that they're not lumbered with it all because that would be uh, I wouldn't wish that on anyone really you know there we are maximizing the room <laughs> So just have to make sure I don't miss out any uh, modern classics or travel titles in this little run. Now, as a general rule, I've not, because it's really awkward to film, I've generally not filmed me doing the last, the very bottom rows of each bookcase because I'm, I'm basically on my hands and knees putting the books in. Some of them I have done if it was easy enough to film, but others I've just left so you may not see absolutely every single shelf, but you'll get the idea. And I do um, show you what they all look like once they've been done, of course. More beer towels. You can use ordinary um, like tea towels as well, and I think I do do that. You know, you can buy a pack of tea towels for like a quid in the pound shop, and they're really good like dust protectors for bookcases. Just fold them in two, and you can get them to cover up the top of your book your books there, and then stop them getting dusty. And needless to say, there's no sunlight coming in here because that is the absolute utter killer. Sliding one odd one in there. Excellent, looking good. 
Right, so this is the very bottom shelf here. I should have a look really, I'm sure beer towels aren't expensive to buy, they're not like make a collectible or anything, I'm sure you can pick up a, a huge load for not a lot of money, but as you can see they're perfect, um, but if you want them looking uniform you're best off buying brand new uh, plain tea towels for your dishes, that'll be good just to use as dust, uh, dust covers. Of course, while I was going through this, I did find a handful of books which were duplicates, which I hadn't had chance to really, because the books were sort of buried, I didn't have chance to really check them properly. Um, and I did do that, so I found a few more uh, penguin doubles, which I've, or like, you know, I could compare to see which were the best sort of examples. So I've done a bit of that during this shunting session. And um, if you watch my channel regularly, you'll know that I do have periodic sales of books which are like duplicates and that and uh, they tend to be extremely popular because I let the books go cheap literally between a pound and three quid um, and there's lots and lots of people you know they buy like a hundred books sometimes so uh, they, they tend to be very popular consequently my stack of spare stuff is uh, rapidly diminished but um, I'm slowly building it up again as uh, new stuff comes my way what I haven't had lately is any like big job lots come my way they've just you know I haven't actively been looking because I've been so busy with other stuff and it does take time to search out a job lot at the right price but nothing's sort of come my way lately uh, in that re respect um, but I have had some really good ones over over the uh, last sort of couple of years particularly a really great science fiction one which the books are absolutely pristine they're all sort of late 60s early 70s and they were in the, not all first editions by any means but they were just in an incredible condition i was so pleased uh, so pleased to get them I gave a few away as presents as well um one viewer begged me for one particular one for an author he collected so i let him have that and uh, um but yeah it was really really great little lot of that Just figuring out what's what. I says, "What was harder?" Um, so I'm literally on my hands and knees now, <laughs> and getting tired. Um, some of these shunting sessions, although you're seeing like the edited highlights, as it were, um, some of these sessions I was in the loft for like three or four hours at a time, and um, you know, because we've in the UK we've had a bank holiday, we've had the, the King's coronation, and uh, other things that have been going on recently, which has given me a bit of extra time off work, so I wanted to maximise it, and I knew that this was going to be a big job, the, the shunting session, so on all these extra days off, I've made the most of it, and I've um, I've tried to film. But I know historically, because I've done a couple of these shunting sessions before, I know historically how popular they are, and people really do seem to like them. So uh, who am I to uh, deprive you of my uh, s sorting shenanigans, eh? But yeah, I've got a very, very busy day. As I film this, it's only like, 10 o'clock in the morning uh, I actually started just after 9 so um, I'm doing this in the morning and I've got a, a 3 hour audio audio commentary to do which is what we're doing now then I've got to walk my daughter's dog um, uh, which is uh, is good, I always love uh, walking him he's still a puppy at the moment, they're called Goose a golden retriever got some posts to do a little bit of shopping then come back and film another video this afternoon and then I'm back to work tomorrow so it's all go you know it's all go <laughs> and now that the heavens have decided to open so I'm not I'm hoping that this rain clears before I do have to walk the dog but I've got a couple of hours yet but it sounds like it's pouring down and there was me optimistically wearing my shorts today so there you go <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
But yeah, if you're in London or nearby and uh, fancy coming to uh, the London Paperback Show, please, please do. And uh, definitely come and say hello. And if you're going to be there, let me know. And we'll, we'll get you in the video as well. I'd love to meet sort of more fans from the channel. And uh, mutual penguin collecting. Um, all the sort of the, the bigger penguin collectors, I'm sure, will be there. Um, I've never, in, in, historically, I've never picked up that actually many penguins at the London Paperback Show. Obviously, you'll see lots of American stuff, and you'll see some of the the more pulpy publishers. Um, but I've never really picked up a lot of penguin stuff there. Um, but it is there. So if you're if you're you know fairly new, it's worth going along. Um, what I like to do is go through like the bargain bins, as it were. And I remember last time, I was pulling out like Dell map backs, those beautiful 1940s airbrushed covers with the maps on the back, published by Dell during the war. And they were like three quid each, and I, I must have pulled out about twenty. Absolutely fantastic. You just don't see those over here. And this was someone thinning out their collection. So that was good. There was a pan dealer who was knocking pan books out at like a pound each. And um, there was another guy who had some absolutely mint four square like file copies almost. They were immaculate. They were like two fifty, three pounds each. I bought a load of those. So there will be stuff there. And I'm just glad this time um, I'll be traveling rather than in a car or a van rather than on foot. <laughs> so here we are so that's that first penguin bookcase a bit of an epic it's the biggest bookcase we'll see today that needed going through but i think you'll agree compared to how it was looking it now looks perfectly merchandised so i'm very happy with that that's the next one we need to do which is uh, uh once again a really old bookcase. i don't even think it's an ikea one it's just a really really old one so that's what we've got to work on next so these are the books uh in the late uh, eight, eight to nine hundred approximately uh, range. Yeah, maybe about 850 to uh, 1040, I reckon. And uh, you can get three stacks on these. So these are a bit more like the traditional IKEA ones that we're now using. But because this is a nice height, very, very easy to get the new acquisitions in here. And. Uh, Although these haven't been gone through book by book and cleaned properly. Um, on the whole, they're not too bad. I've not got too... Post 1000, I'm a bit pickier about my condition. Um, because, you know, space is at a premium. So I've not got too much that's in low grade. Unless it's something that I consider to be quite rare. Or if I've got a handful that are signed books and that post 1000. Um, and they may be slightly lower quality. Uh, than the rest of the run but on the whole they're pretty nice you know and uh, this was a period which when you read books penguin books from this period they just feel so good in the hand they are fantastic um these sort of late 40s upwards ones they just they're so well made and i, I love them they just feel great better than a lot of other publishers of the period you know who used much cheaper paper No, that's not going to fit. <laughs> so I actually put that particular book out of position because I don't want to waste the space. So that big thick one there goes at the start of the next pile, basically. And I'm starting to get a bit of an overflow. So I can't file all the books away as they were. There, there, there is an overflow now on each sort of bookcase shelf. But thankfully, as I knew, I had just about enough room towards the end of the 3000 to get the whole lot safely uh, filed away. A few, um, there's those more modern ones you can see there. That's 1984, and it's like a later 60s one, then I think it's a, an edition from a few years ago. Um, books like 1984, all the various copies of Day of the Triffids I've got, I just um, try and keep them all relatively together. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a good good little period for Penguin. Some great authors, great titles being published. They were doing their uh, author fives and tens, and uh, they were doing really well. Yeah, and, and the books themselves were just great. So, uh, yeah, a very very good period in Penguin Penguin history. Good stuff. Now the shelf below it, and you see that one with the the green spine there, orange and green. That's uh, Churchill's History of the Second World War, Volume One. Read that, and uh, instantly had to go and get the rest of the Churchill volumes because it was that good. Absolutely phenomenal. Oh, this is one of the ones that was actually a double. This is the Abraham Games edition of Whiskey Galore. And um, they're both the same printing. I just wanted to get the best sort of copy to keep for myself. And then the other one will go in my swaps box. I still haven't quite got all the Abrams games. I think I'm missing two now. So no, I've almost got them. And then um, I'm going to do a little dedicated video on those. Because they are really nice. So these are the tail end of the uh, penguin travels sliding in here. Not many, just a handful left to go. And then um, then we're on to the new sort of 60s period ones, which were new additions. So I'm just making the most of the space now, exactly as we've been doing beforehand. But I am pleased that the bookcases allow double stacking because I'd be in a right state without it. <laughs> I can tell you that. Once again, I'm not sure, I can't remember if I filmed the bottom shelf or not, because I said they can be quite fiddly to film when you're on your hands and knees, but I might have. Um, I think I just put all the books in a huge run, because it just makes it easier to slide the new additions in, and uh, work on it that way.
Aku Aku, Thor Heyerdahl. What a book that is. Absolutely fantastic. Highly recommend reading that. Even if you're not into travel books, that is a, it reads, well, not like a thriller, but it just, it's edgy as seat stuff. It's so, so good. So recommended. And that particularly white looking penguin there is the 50th anniversary of Lady Chatterley in penguin form. So uh, if you're wondering what that super clean penguin was, that's what it is. Okay, hands and knees job again now. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. It's killing me. <laughs> Start to feel old when you do these. And uh, as you can see, I'd done a lot this day, this one day, so. Um, I was starting to feel tired and this is why you know I didn't want to overdo it and I did it over the course of a, yeah, about four or five days in the end because it's such a huge job but it's one that if you don't keep on top of it you know because I dip into my book collection all the time for various videos I need to keep on top of it and it got to the stage where you know it was a bit in disarray and I didn't want that to carry on so I needed to get get things up to date and uh, I said I've got some shows coming up in order to make sure everything was was as up to date as possible all my lists and things like that all my spares and doubles were cleared out prior to the uh, prior to the shows I haven't quite totted up how many books I've got in my collection. Um, I did a couple of years ago. I estimated that it was, I don't know, over over ten thousand. Um, but I might, as the next sort of um, epic video, I might do one where I film all the spines for all my books, and um, I might go through and, and tot them all up to see how many I've got at the same time. Um, might be quite interesting to know, but I, I, it is upward. It's over ten thousand books, but I, I don't know exactly how many. I, it could even be, you know, closer to fifteen. I, don't, I just don't know. There's a lot. There is a lot of books here. filing a few more here so it's much much easier to file these away when they're like that and you just need to slip slip them in and of course these later ones the numbers are so much easy, easier to be identify so it's, it's simple it's a simple job to slide them all back into their uh, rightful homes obviously in this period I've not got complete runs um, sadly uh, but they are all in numerical order and that's how I like to keep them
setting the camera again for the I think the bottom shelf now I think this is uh, I don't know if I call it a day after this one or not um, and have it and then we see it the next day or if I do push on and try and finish the penguins I might try and finish the penguins then we've got some smaller publishers to look at and then we we crack on with the pans then which perhaps can be a bit more interesting to look at because they've got um, such a variety of covers and a bit more colorful but uh, we'll get to them in due course For some reason, the bottom shelf is always a lot harder to merchandise. I think it's just down to its location more than anything else. And I'm virtually well, not lying on the floor, but I am on the floor <laughs> on my hands and knees trying to do it. And, um, well, it's a tiring old job. I've seen some fantastic collections over the years. I really have. And um, you know, when I first started collecting penguins and I first moved into my current house, I did have my brother-in-law come around and he built uh, like an alcove, um, like a big L shape, which was floor to ceiling, dedicated paperback sized shelving and it was fantastic but you know I soon outgrew it and also when we got the dog um, and it was susceptible to the sun as well I didn't really want the books down there so I moved it all up into the loft at that point and uh, sort of got the loft boarded out so that we could uh, so that I could put them up there which is where they are right now which is good, it's a, it's a good place to have it. It's accessible, I can easily get to most of the, the books. And as I said, I've got stuff downstairs as well in, in the bedroom in the office, so um, most of my collection is accessible, but it's not the same as having it all in like one dedicated library room. That's that's the dream, isn't it, you know? So uh, there's another double I, I came across. Last little line going back in now. And I believe I take a well earned break at this point. <laughs> and maybe so should you, because we're about halfway through. A little over. But yeah, I reckon I've probably, because of all the prep work and things like that, I've probably um, 
got about nine hours down to three, should we say, <laughs> in doing all this, because there's so much like prep work. But there we are, they're looking good. Let's see if I do a little, uh, yeah, there's a little rundown of it looking fully merchandised now, those two particular bookcases, which were by far the most complicated ones to do out of the entire sort of shunting session. But they do look, yeah, they're as good, as good as I can get them to look now. Everything numerically ordered and uh, easily accessible. And that's the little bit we've got left to do for the main series. Going to the right of that, you don't quite see him, but I've got puffins and penguin specials and things like that. But this is the tail end. So these are the, going to be the books between, you know, sort of two and three thousand. And also anything which is in B format, I've got the B format books separate at the end. So they're sort of in the shelf below. So we'll do these next two shelves here. But these bookcases are only half size, so they're sort of waist height. Um, as opposed to, you know, full size, and uh, but this is predominantly where my '60s penguins are, as you can see. And I do, I've got a newfound love of the '60s penguins because, well, they are 60 years old, and I love the decade. I love, you know, the sort of the art design and that, and and the '70s stuff for that matter. Um, so yeah some good stuff for penguin around this period that's a, a rare one there that's silent spring an early book on um the use of pesticides in fact uh, not global warming but pesticides sliding in more modern classics here obviously all the travel is released separately now so uh, they're not part of the main series they're just sort of released as standalones or as pelicans But yeah, there's not a lot of penguin science fiction I'm missing now. I've got a really comprehensive run of it. I'm so pleased because um, Penguin didn't publish a lot of science fiction, but what they did publish was really good quality stuff. The creme de la creme, you could say, and uh, very, very pleased with what I've got now in that regard. It's one of the new ones, Man in the High Castle, Philip K. Dick. What a beautiful edition. That took me a long time to get. And in the end, I got one off doors at Bob's. So I was very pleased with that. Also, that copy of USA, another nice one. But uh, Man, Man, Man in the High Castle was one I was really pleased to get. I had the, I had the second print in a penguin, never owned the first. So, yeah, that was a, that was a super cool pickup, that one. Lots of extras just slide in into the main run. New additions. Another great SF title, Mandrake. on the shelf. Yeah, I'd, ultimately I would like to get everything up to about number 3001, 3200 prior to ISBNs coming in. Whether I'll ever get that far, I don't know. I need to get lucky really with um, sort of the post 1000 ones. But over the years I have seen sort of collectors, for example, put up, you know, 
I remember seeing one. It was a complete run of you know all penguins, one thousand to two thousand, and it was like <laughs> it worked out like one pound fifty a book. And it was the complete run. Well, Why should I have bought them? <laughs> but I just didn't have anything like the space at the time. But I should have. Um, you know these things in hindsight, of course. <laughs> But I gotta admit, it would have been two to three thousand. That's actually more appealing, because there's some really edgy and cool uh, books published in that period. But yeah, this is the first really good penguin sort of I had in months, absolutely months and months. So it was overdue. But as you can see, all these ones going in, they're all science fiction titles, all new acquisitions. Just so pleased with them. Some of these with Alan Aldrich covers as well, which I really like. Or, or David Pelham ones as well. A little bit later on. As I said, I got at the end of my penguin run. I've got my B formats, the larger formats, and I've got my uh, early ISBN titles as well, which are books that I want to keep um, with my main penguin run. But they are, you know, early seventies titles. So they're not part of the main series; they're just ISBN. tighter to get this uh, particular batch out but we got there in the end and now I just have to file in any new additions So I'm quite curious what um, what other penguin collectors, you know, what their goals are, what their collecting limitations are. I mean, when I first started collecting penguins, I, I very much wanted the first thousand. I, I thought I can do that, um, but ultimately, there's so much good stuff beyond that that I thought oh, just pre ISBM, and that's been sort of my um, you know, collecting vintage paperbacks. That's sort of been my mantra. However, just lately I have been enjoying more um, sort of 70s and 80s stuff um, but that can be tricky to find because um, it's not really regarded as vintage but it's out there you just need to keep your eyes peeled for it really you know so I was able to get a first of um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy recently without too much trouble um, and I've consequently gone on and got the second and third books in that series because it's uh, super cool and I was very uh, very much a big fan of that um, back in the day a little bit fiddly getting access here to see what I'm actually doing <laughs> and uh, this isn't a particularly well lit part of my collection so uh, I'm having to sort of it looks a little bit grainy unfortunately uh, picture wise but you know it is what it is you know um, 
it's not supposed to be high high quality cinematography here <laughs> it's very much just showing my process and, and this is you know, just something that i go through as a book collector at least you know twice a year i have to do one of these shunting sessions simply because i'm still picking up new acquisitions so to keep it all in, in good order this is the way i do it away new additions One thing I've not really shown on the channel is my uh, uh, larger format books like Puffin Picture Books and I've got Alan Lane Christmas books, uh, not all of them by any means, I've got you know, some, a handful. Um, I've got about half the Puffin Picture books in my collection and I've got other sort of things, the Penguin scores I've got complete. I've got a handful of Penguin Modern Painters which are quite nice. Um, The Puffin Picture Books would definitely warrant their own sort of dedicated video, but the other ones I'll just sort of um, lump in as like Penguin Minor Series or something like that. But those are the uh, the B format books now, and um, Penguin didn't do loads of B format. A lot of the cartoon books are in B format, and some of their special ones, like the Ulysses, there is in B format. Um, the earliest one I think I got was that T. Lawrence Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and then these are my tail end ones, which are uh, at the end of the uh, the post numerical series and early ISBNs. I uh, haven't quite got enough room there, but I've got enough just to uh, get most of it on the shelf. That's pretty much what it looks like now, so they look absolutely fine. There's a little bit on top, but nothing I'm too worried about, in all honesty. And that, you'll be pleased to hear, concludes the, uh, the Vintage Penguins. Um, got more bits and pieces underneath but that that's for another video so you remember this is where we uh, emptied stuff earlier on and took the books downstairs so that now gives me a little bit of breathing room to sort some books out there because ultimately this is going to be uh, for some pans but I'm going to use the space to sort out uh, vintage Badger books so um, Badger was a publisher not Brown Watson it became um, who published quite pulpy sort of they started as pulps in fact um books in a few different genres so there's science fiction supernatural there's some war ones romance and spy and the odd like celebrity book and um 
They're quite distinctive with their yellow spines, but they hardly ever turn up in the wild these days. I think they're very, very scarce. And um, I have, over the years, if I've come across them, in, as long as they're not falling to bits, I've pretty much picked them out. Um, particularly the SF and Supernatural ones, because they're the ones that you know, interest me the most, and they've got some really great outlandish titles. Um, a lot of them are written by one guy. It's uh, Lionel Fanthorpe, who's still around. And um, I've met him a couple of times, and he signed uh, signed the books that I've put under his nose that were written under a variety of pseudonyms. So, uh, yeah, they, they're good fun to collect. At this point, I did want to thank my uh, Patreon and channel members for their continued support. Some of these uh, people have been with me for years now, literally years, and um, I very much appreciate it because uh, yeah, the sort of revenue you get from doing videos on YouTube is very much a roller coaster, and um, there's no real consistency there, um, in all honesty. And um, having um, having supporters paying you almost directly or well, through the YouTube membership system um, really does help an awful lot as I think any YouTuber will tell you that so thank you very much guys uh, for and girls for your continued support is much appreciated So yeah, I was quite lucky in that um, uh, my friend Bob had quite a few. He basically, I don't know how long ago it was, but a fair few years now, probably 10 to 20 years ago, he uh, had a call out the blue to say that there's loads of these books here, which you know the, the owner of them has passed away. Um, if you don't clear them out, they're going to go to the skip. And uh, when he went down to collect them, it was... Um, basically the publisher of Badger Books and uh, a lot of them were file copies and proof copies and uh, they were all, you know, unread basically. Um, they weren't all in top condition but they were very, very nice condition so there was a lot, and, and Bob basically bought the whole lot, they put it all into bin bags and took it home with him um, and Bob's personal collection, he just collects the SF and Supernatural, is fantastic he's just missing one odd book in really tip top shape and uh, he's got the full set um, I'm not quite as lucky as that um, I've got just what you see here but um, thanks to Bob I've been able to get some really nice high grade examples which I'm uh, very pleased to own indeed and uh, one or two doubles as well which will go into my next um, swaps video whenever that may be I have actually got um, the uh, a look at my badger collection um, penciled in for quite soon so uh, we'll get that get that done because it'll be brilliant So certainly not a massive collection, but it's just not the sort of publisher you come across in quantity. They just aren't out there. So uh, really, really pleased to have what I've got, and that's the uh, that's the main thing. And then for the time being, I put my run of um, American Executioner paperbacks in the front, some of the really early ones there. So 
So next I'm sorting out my digit paperbacks. And once again, I've not done too badly. I've had a nice little run of... Um, those are all new acquisitions there. So probably another you know, 15 to 20 books that have come my way in the digit land. And don't often come across them once again in the wild anymore. They're far scarcer than, say, Pam books, which were published around the same time. And I'm a real fan of them. I really like digit books. I can't remember. It's been quite a while since I've shown my digit collection on the channel. So it may be because I'm likely to buy a few more Badger books in the next few months. I might do a digit dedicated video rather than a Badger one just to show my uh, sort of updated collection. So I might have a little think about that and change my mind and maybe do digit instead. We shall have to see. But that's all the new ones sort of sorted into numerical order. And now I just have to uh, amalgamate them into the main collection. So I'm getting a bit of a run of a digit. I mean, there's about 800 titles that were published. So, you know, I've probably got maybe a quarter now. Maybe. I know Mars at Zardos has got more that I need, but I haven't really gone through properly. Um, and I'm sort of, you know, I'm a bit pickier on condition. Um, I don't want them in just any old shape, but at the same time, they are quite scarce. As I said, you just never really come across them. Definitely not in quantity at all, really. But they've got a particular look, and I, I do enjoy them. And uh, they got some good titles in there as well. sorting the new releases into, or the new editions rather, into a correct numerical order. When I'm away and I do come across digit books, I try and pick up the ones which are, and this is a little tip, which are very thick. So you see that like copy of Troll there with the yellow spine. Um, I pick that one up deliberately because if I was to try and track that down online, um, it would fall into the realm of a small parcel because it's, it's much bigger than a normal sized letter. So consequently, the postage on that is going to be three quid. I don't want to be spending, say, 650 on that particular book so it's one of those ones if I'm out and about and I'm in a bookshop and I come across something that I'm not massively 
fussed if I buy it or not. But I think, well, it's a huge book. Probably the time to buy it is now. Then I pick it up, and that's definitely the case with Pam books. I try and pick up the thicker ones if I see them, even if I'm not particularly looking for that title, simply because those are the ones that are going to cost a few quid to send. So, uh, in the long run, it makes sense to, to find and buy those ones when you see them. So I always go for the thicker books if they come my way. So there's a little a little buying tip for you there. And that, you know, as you can see, really Digit didn't publish a lot of really thick books. Maybe because they didn't want to outprice themselves of the market, but they did a few. There's another thick one there that I got fairly recently as well. Can't quite remember the title there now. But yeah, I think rather than doing the badges, I think I might revise my uh, my plan and maybe do the uh, do my updated digit collection because I have had a few new additions and it would be quite nice to do the whole lot in one hit again. Um, one area that really needs some focus on, and, and I didn't do it this time round, but I've picked up quite a lot of new Corgi books. And I know my friend Bob has got a nice run of Corgi, but I've not really dug into it to, to figure out the ones that I need. He's got good science fiction ones, of course, you know, with the uh, the green spines, which Corgi are famous for with their SF. So um, that's another area I think I'll do once I've visited Bob um, and I think I'm going up next month. I think I'm going up in June. I'll um, I'll make particular attention to finally getting whatever he's got left with Badger and Corgi. I think um, so that I can do really good videos on those particular publishers. But thankfully, apart from the first about 180 digits, which aren't numbered, the rest of them are. So it does make them quite easy to uh, file away. Um, after that big pile of digits, I put then my run of um, Philip K. Dick. Uh, and um, just this is like miscellaneous Philip K. Dick titles, which aren't really part of uh, any main collection. Because the bottom shelf underneath is an absolutely overloaded shelf of Fontana books and um, they were absolutely desperate to have some extra room so uh, I'm, I'm sorting those ones out but there are some authors who I do collect when I find them and they're not part of a particular paperback publisher collection they're just an author collection so those are J.G. Ballard, Philip K. Dick and uh, Philip Jose Farmer. So I've got collections of all three of those authors ongoing and I've got editions from all over the place as well as entries in, you know, various series. So, um, you know, I like to just pick those, those you know, prolific authors up when I can. Um, the Philip Jose Farmer is going to be a huge job, but I'm getting there. I've certainly already got all my favourites, which is the main thing, thing I wanted to get. So now anyway, this is a bit of a an early Fontana sort out session. So I didn't have too many out of position, but I did have quite a few new acquisitions that needed sorting, um, and it was desperately needed the extra space. So um, it was a good time to do it really whilst I was doing this sort of particular bookcase.
Yeah, unfortunately, a bit of the sorting is being done out of out of camera slightly. We are quite low down. I'm in my stool there. Um, but yeah, look at that. Two hours we've been going now, amazingly, uh, there or thereabouts. So we're in the home stretch. Um, and I will finish off you know, what we're doing here before we uh, dig into the pan books, which uh, I always love sorting my pan books out. And it's an area where I've been picking up the most new acquisitions, I think, lately. It's been really nice pan titles. But these Fontanas are lovely. I, I really do like them, but they can be tricky to, to pick up in Nice Nick. And um, once again, they used to be so common. Uh, this is obviously what the Collins Crime Club morphed into was the uh, the Fontana paperback list. And a lot of their staples, like Agatha Christie, for example, just Andrew Goff, they just moved over from Collins Crime into Fontana. But I do enjoy them. Um, I did pick up a few at um, Morris's. He had some really great uh, Second World War escape books, which I picked up, which some of which I'd never seen, and they were in lovely condition. So I was really pleased to get those from Morris last time we went. And um, yeah, he's very much on my list to visit again soon. Still, some of the uh, the later Fontanas, the uh, late sixties, seventies, and early eighties ones, with those lovely painted Tom Adams covers, which I absolutely love. And um, I haven't tracked them all down yet, but I've got a fair few of them. There's not many I'm missing now, and uh, they're not difficult to get a hold of, but they are very, very nice. As are those, of course. Once again, a very distinct look. The uh, the black typeface on the yellow spines, very much like the door books, and a bit similar to the Badger books. But these obviously came before Badger and Door. And it was a good identity to have, wasn't it? It was just as bold as the uh, the green and black of the Collins Crime Club, but these really do have an identity, and they do stand out a mile when you uh, when you see them. Just don't see them in nice nick that often anymore. So now that I've finally got the uh, the last of the Fontanas numerically sorted, you can't see it very well, but I'm filing those ones in now on the bottom shelf. But yeah, I do enjoy the Fontanas, and uh, they were a quality paperback publisher and went for a long, long time. There's about 3,000 Fontanas in the list. Um, maybe even more than that but um, it's the early ones that I particularly like you know and uh, I'd love to be able to say I've got the first thousand or something like that but I don't know anyone else who even collects them obviously there's lots of people who collect the uh, Agatha Christie ones because she is so collectible in her own right um, but I don't know anyone who collects like all the vintage Fontanas at all so maybe I'm unique in that particular regard but you can see why when you get a collection of them together they do look really good and generally the authors are of a good quality and I think that's what makes a good paperback list that's why that's what first attracted me to Penguin that you could collect a vintage paperback publisher and have a lot of good stuff to actually read and that's that's almost like one of the main reasons for doing it is that you know you've got lovely looking books as well as uh, you know a really good quality library. But yeah, they very much needed the extra room and I was pleased to uh, get these finally done. 
but no doubt it'll have a, a few changes around over the next few months but there we are so this is basically i've just sorted those out got all the new additions filed in so the uh, badges and the digit books and the uh, the fontanas and they're looking good i think they they look good got some um science fiction and my hard case crime on the bottom there that's the new new writings in sf and my pile of philip jose farmer and of course that's created a bit more room to the right there but i'm going to need to yeah, change that around a little bit so that was it for that day yen yet another day right this is probably day four i managed to get all of this done in a day and it was the uh the great pan rework so i've got new additions i've got my pan sf i've got pan horror and all of this has to be put back in in a numerical fashion so they're all in the right numbers and then i basically have to rebuild the displays plus i've got more books than i've got bookcase space for currently so i knew that i had a whole extra bookcase area just around the corner which we just saw which i could fill up with pam so it very much was shunting them along um, and having a what well, a full-on shunting session um, to get all the pans looking groovy again so i do them numerically so we're starting with the pan unnumbered the very earliest pan paperbacks and hardbacks and then we'll go into the pan numbered series which goes up to about number 430 something like that and uh, because of the uh, the way that my collection is stored um, I've got a half bookcase to begin with with a few books on top then we've got two full IKEA bookcases the, the, like the new style that I bought and that's it for the pan books but we then need to go around to the next side because um, the pan books are expanding and uh, I needed another shelf basically So um, these all were uh, strategically stacked, you could say. <laughs> Once again, just maximizing my space more than anything. That's all I'm really doing. It was a bit of a long old job this one and I have edited it down so you've only got the highlights you're not going to see absolutely every single bit of the process but you'll see most of it and uh, this first bit was the fiddliest bit really because I'm trying to get um, the stacks put in place um, they're not sitting on a bookshelf they're just on the top of the bookcase really you know so a little bit fiddlier to, to do But I've got the full set of the pan numbered series. I've got the whole lot now, uh, which is quite nice. So I know um, the only ones that aren't in this main run are uh, Casino Royale and Moonraker because they're separate on the next shelf over with my Bond run. So uh, they're the only ones that are actually missing. Of course, what confuses a lot of collectors is that not every number got used, which is a bit annoying. Um, but that's how it was. This was the, you know, the post-war publishing boom when pretty much anything would sell you know paperback wise the there was a massive massive demand for reading and self-education and uh, pan were more than happy to uh, fill this this sort of demand for people to read for pleasure and um, they were there 
Uh, so all sorts of stuff got published. But in the hurdy-gurdy of it, certain books were planned, a number was reserved and it never got used, and uh, consequently there are now missing numbers, there's missing G's, there's missing uh, just number only series ones, there's missing X's, so you know, not everything got used and um, sometimes that can drive collectors around the twist. It did actually happen with the Penguin Specials as well, there was a few numbers that never got used for the same reasons, you know, it was wartime and uh, books got abandoned during publication or just never came to fruition so they were uh, cancelled but the number had already been allocated so uh, it didn't go back and get reused well there we are it's already starting to come together it doesn't take long they do look really good nice colorful spines it's one of the things the cover art in particular with pan is one of the things that really attracted me right from the early days I first started collecting them uh, because I was collecting the James Bond books and I'd had a donation of my dad's James Bonds and my mum's pan Agatha Christie's so I had um, almost like a starter collection of vintage pan books and that sort of me started me on the path of collecting them and uh, I did on and off for you know since since I've had the books so since I was a teenager really um, it's only in you know, sort of the recent last sort of 20, 25 years I've really gone to town. I've eased off collecting stuff like comics and records and toys, and I've got much more into my uh, my book content, which is something I never really di didn't ever not collect. I've always collected books um, my entire life, really. So I've got. Yeah, to one side I've got the main run, to another side I've got books in a box which need to be filed back in. And then I need ultimately I need to rebuild the bookcase, so that's what, what we're doing now. I uh not sure if you saw my video where I visited um Tim Kitchen. Uh, Tim runs the Ticket.net website, and Tim's uh, got the best you know collection of pan books outside of pan themselves. And um, Tim's got some fantastic bookcases that were sort of purpose built, and it holds an awful lot of books and do look fantastic when they're all done. But even he hasn't got enough. Um, it seems whatever space you've got for a book collection, you just end up filling it. <laughs> Or is that just me? I don't know. But that looks good. That's that's how I like to see it, you know. <laughs> nice colourful shelves of pan books lovely and uh, yeah they get a celebratory couple of uh, couple of beer towels on top as well because um, I do put little bits of ephemera and bits and pieces on on there just to tart it up a little bit I've got like little um, you know cutouts there like bit pan books logo stuff and things like that so um, I've peppered a bit of that around the bookcases I'd like to do a bit more of that because um, I did those ages ago just for a bit of fun I pulled some images off the net and um, uh, put them onto a, you know, some A4 and then got them laminated and cut them out um, but uh, I'd like to do some new ones I think and uh, maybe I'll make some available for people to download um, online you know viewers of the channel that might be quite good fun my trusty stool again and we're at the right height uh, to put the next back so this is still numbered um, pan books um, as I said there's about 400 in total for 4, 430 433 something like that so 
um, there's a fair old batch to get through and I've started picking up if it's later editions in the numbered series that I haven't got but they've got different covers rather than just a different printing if it's got a, a noticeably different cover I will pick them up so I think one of these early ones like Dumb Witness I think Magatha Christie I've got the first three printings and they're all uh, or the first three different cover designs and they are all different I think it's printings yeah, one, three, and five, or something like that, you know, and they've all got slightly different covers with the little uh, uh, Scotty dog on the front. A really, really nice, nice jacket, that one, and a good story as well. I don't know if you can hear the rain pit pit pattering in the background. Looks like I might be getting wet on my dog walk. <laughs> Unless it clears up by then. Maximising my space. Four little stacks and a couple on the end. So it rolls. Get them all stood up as straight as possible, like soldiers. And you've got to admit, as spine art goes, they are the most colourful of all the uh, all the series that I collect, aren't they? They really are great with that uniform pan logo down the bottom. I think they just look fantastic. I really do. Very, very nice indeed. It takes a lot to be pan books, and that's why after Penguin, they are my second. Uh, second favourite publisher you know, to collect. I really do love them. And thankfully this still plentiful. You know, they had big runs in a lot of cases and you can still find them. It's not difficult to get um, a collection together. I don't think anyway. So on to the next shelf. I think you'll be in to see the, the trend here. <laughs>
So yeah, this was definitely an epic few days. Uh, yes, that is three copies of the Coldridge story. Sorry, but it's uh, one of my all-time favourite uh, vintage pan books, so I've got duplicate copies of that particular one. I absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, it was an epic an epic sorting period. I don't think I've ever done so much in one week, and I still didn't quite finish it all, which is a little annoying, I, but as I said, I just ran out of time. There was nothing I could do about it. Um, I definitely wanted to uh, do those last sort of American ones, but that's something that I'll uh, do in the future. And if I can film it, I will. Um, so you can have like a little shunting section, uh, shunting session extra feature or something like that down the line. So yeah, so looking ahead on the channel, we have got some really good stuff planned. As I say, I've got the Shepton Toy Fair coming up. I've got the London Paperback Show coming up. Um, a little while back, I filmed my friend George's 1960s Doctor Who collection. And we also filmed his run of Amazing Spider-Man 1 to 100 complete, which is an incredible, incredible run. So um, George and I have now set the date to do the follow-up, which will be Doctor Who memorabilia from the 1970s. And we're going to do another comic book run, which is going to be Uncanny X-Men 1 to 100. So the original X-Men run, which will be sort of fantastic. So we've got that lined up. Um, I got my next video with Andy, uh, the bubblegum and trading card maestro, and that's going to be, I believe, sort of 1960s TV shows, like miscellaneous 1960s TV shows. So we got that one coming up, which should be quite cool. Um, what else have we got coming up? Book-wise, as I said, I've got. Um, I'm going to do the digit run, and. Um, I've got a book I'm just finishing off reading now for review as well. So uh, that's a King Kong, look at the King Kong creation of the Universal King Kong movie uh, based on the Edgar Wallace sort of script by Stephen Jones. So I've got that one to do a dedicated review of. I've got the second half of the Agatha Christie facsimiles to film. Uh, but I'm just waiting for my sister, whose books they are, to drop down the... Uh, the last five which were missing from uh, the boxes she gave me but we found them now so um, I just need those to finish that little lot off and um, similar to doing all this sorting for the books I want to be sorting out some of my uh, uh, vintage uh, action figures as well so um, I've got that that needs uh, sort of looking at so I'm going to um, do some Star Wars content quite soon. Um, I'd like to do another vintage paperback sales, eBay sales video, because I haven't done one of those for a little while, and I'd like to do some more sort of themed ones rather than anything else. If I can... Third shelf's almost in place. Looking good. There we are. So I didn't show you doing the bottom shelf, as I said I won't in some cases. But there we are. So that's that first sort of half size bookcase, fully merchandised with lovely pan action. That's what we've still got to do. Quite a bit. But that's like the last of it. But quite a bit there still to do. So this is sort of like eye level. So it's a bit easier to film. And um, these aren't so time consuming you know we can just do like a shelf um, fairly quickly to uh, to zoom through these but uh, 
the numbered series is now finished and we're now onto the G's so that's uh, the great pans and then we move into the X's and the M's and, and the other like minor series but these are the greats and uh, these have got some of the, the best covers of all particularly the, the 1950s ones they are you know by some of the top pan artists who you recognize people like Pef and Rex and people like that and they're just gorgeous Taylor is another one superb and I think against the white Ikea bookcases the, the covers really and the colors really stand out don't they I think they look fantastic good stuff I said all the James Bond ones are on the shelf next to this one, and they, you know, all the James Bond plus related titles uh, do. Um, they take up an entire shelf because it was such a big part of Pan's publishing, and uh, the Ian Fleming list pretty much kept Pan afloat for a long time. You know, it really did help their bottom line more than you could ever imagine. I think um, I s remember speaking to reps in the nineties who had worked for Pan in the early 70s. And uh, they would tell me that um, even back then, like 20 years after the phenomenon of James Bond really hit, um, how important James Bond was to the, to the list. And they would be, you know, the reps back then in the 1960s would go to a bookshop and um, there would be say 10 new Pan titles that month. And the, one of them might be a James Bond one, and so the, the the big bookshop would order say ten of each new title, but the James Bond title they'd order two hundred or three hundred of, because they just sold that many copies. I thought that was really interesting and also really telling because um, the books just were huge huge sell sellers, weren't they? Just enormous, and they were constantly being reprinted. And uh, that's why I guess they're so popular still today. There's nostalgic for people, plus. The, the, the books are still in the public eye. We're still with James Bond movies. Um, the books are still being talked about. And there's new James Bond fiction being produced. I recently picked up the uh, Charlie Hickson one on His Majesty's Secret Service, which was pretty cool. I managed to pick up a signed one direct from the uh, Ian Fleming Foundation, which was pretty cool. There was a bit of footage that Charlie Hickson shared on Twitter of him going down to the warehouse and signing all the copies, which was quite nice. But once again, while I'm going through all these pan books, I'm, I'm refiling in all the science fiction and all the horror titles that have been pulled out for that dedicated video. I've been thinking about doing um, uh, more movie tie-ins, so perhaps a Penguin movie tie-ins in Penguin books or movie tie-ins in Pan books. But there's there are an awful lot of them, and some of them are just a bit boring. In all honesty, they're not that good. Um, some of them are, some of them are absolute classics. Other ones are, you know, very much wishy-washy. So it's something I'll probably get round to eventually. But um, you know. It's sort of on the list, but I'm not sure when exactly I'm going to get around to doing it. But I will, eventually. Strategically uh, balancing and putting these back at the same time. <laughs> but you do, uh, the more you handle paperbacks, the more you get to know what sort of weights your hands can handle and uh, you can slip them all in. 
but these are very very nice this is a great period in pan history and uh, I just love them these 50s titles they are just superb really really superb tough to beat is what I'd say they are tough to beat And of course, Pan were much keener to try different genres. You know, they published westerns, they published science fiction, lots of crime, and they had real success with it. Whereas some of the other publishers, people like Penguin, were a little bit more highbrow, you could say, and they, they weren't prepared to risk things so much as Pan. And I wonder if Penguin were ever offered, say, you know, Casino Royale. I'd love to know if that was the case. You know, did they ever get offered that and th did they turn it down or did you know pan try and buy the rights straight away um, it'd be interesting to know wouldn't it because uh, as I said well as we just discussed it certainly made pan the publisher that it became so here we are next shelf down and I'm on my uh, my paper backing stool <laughs> but I said these don't take too long although there's a lot of them to do um, because it's only like you know five big stacks um, and plus filing the new stuff away it's not taking hours and hours for every single bookcase or bookshelf like some of the bigger penguin ones did There we are, more familiar spine action. A little bit of an overflow there as well, of course. And we'll get that now because uh, I haven't quite got enough room. This is why we needed the extra bookcase because I didn't have enough room for all the books. Sounds like it stopped raining again, which is good news. But yeah, we're in a really good period here and the books just, uh, they almost shelve themselves, they really do. The numbers are nice and clear, so there's no squinting to try and see a particular number. just about squeeze those ones in once again a very colorful selection of spines I mean you've got to say the spine art was great and I'm not sure if Pan had an artistic director I suppose they must have really um, they must they probably had an art department and maybe it was the overall the editors there people like Herbert Van Thal um, or Clarence Paget possibly who were steering the artistic line um, of, of the look of the, the list but they certainly succeeded didn't they and uh, they got a very very distinctive look just makes them brilliant fun to collect yeah I 
lovely stuff. Here we are, next shelf down. We're very much into the um, X's now. So the G's will finish and we start the Pan X series, which is the Pan Giants. And I think with the pans, I've been a little bit more forgiving with the condition of some of them. I'm a bit stricter now, of course, but there's a few of my early ones which, because um, they're the only copies that I've got, I don't want to get rid of them until I've replaced them. So I've got an ongoing upgrade list where I've been cleaning my pan books on my other channel systematically. And uh, as I go through, I do uh, keep my upgrades listed and um, it is actually really nice to get an upgrade if you've got a really tatty copy and you can track down a really nice one or you come across a really nice one um, even when you're not looking for it it's a real yeah I really enjoy that sense of uh, oh yes I finally can get rid of that dog from my collection sort of thing you know I think every collector loves to do an upgrade certainly uh, in the days of having old comics collecting old comics that was uh, the case as well Well, the helicopter seems to be back. The lawnmowers haven't really stopped. So I hope it's not been too distracting and uh, you've been able to enjoy uh, seeing me go through these uh, these books. I can't imagine many people are gonna sit through all three hours of this, um, but you might watch it in segments or just watch the bits that you're interested in. Um, you might be a Penguin fan, but not at all interested in old pan books um, or vice versa. So um, I'll try when I upload this to put in little chapters so you can just jump to the bits that you might be interested in save you uh, going through it any other way so yeah it looks like all things happening we've got the lawnmowers going we've got a, a helicopter above and it sounds like it's raining so um Thankfully, I am in the studio, and it is, it's not soundproofed, but it's got, um, uh, it shouldn't echo too badly, and often, although I can hear quite a bit of things going on around me, um, it's usually pretty forgiving once the videos actually get released, um, so uh, fingers crossed it's not too distracting. some of the very early X titles very very big thick books those ones and um, harder to find in nice condition so once again I make a point if I come across them and they're nice nick I will pick them up uh, simple as that because these are the harder ones to find I definitely like to make the most of my space and uh, I think you know you can see I've definitely succeeded doing that over this video I wonder how many books I've actually handled in this video it's got to be got to be a few thousand doesn't it I would say <laughs> Even some of those, like there's two copies of Peyton Place there because two very different and distinct covers. So I, you know, I've kept them both basically. Right, I didn't show you the bottom shelf because as I said I'm, it's just me on my hands and knees. But there's that second pound bookcase now, fully merchandised, and I think you'll agree, looking rather lovely. 
very very nice and everything filed away numerically just how we like it but I've still got a fair bit to do I've got the, the second bookcase now the top row is James Bond and we're not touching those because I didn't really have any James Bond to file away just one old book which I did so now we're on to uh, the carrying on with the X series here some more pan giants same principle sliding in all the uh, all the ones that I've had out recently not sure where all this noise is coming from I do have a suspicion that possibly um, it's not a helicopter at all um, so like most of the UK um, we're getting um, full fiber installed throughout the country and although where I live we've got Virgin Media who installed full fiber you know 15 years ago where I live um, we're just getting the official British Telecom stroke open reach full fiber put in so um, uh, I have a feeling it can't because of the rain they can't be mowing it must be something to do with them digging up the roads uh, so possibly that's what it is all this background noise and I'm thinking it was Thursday um, I did predict that they would have done our bit before them but it might go on for a little bit of time yet so uh, I might have to start doing some of these um, in the evening if it gets too noisy But it is absolutely pouring with rain out there, so uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to be getting wet today. <laughs> but that's all right, I can take it. But yeah, all I can think of is the noise is, is possibly the builders getting ready to dig up the road. Um, I don't know how long it takes to lay full fibre. It's going to take a little bit of time because they seem to have been doing the far end of my road for ages and I just thought oh, they must be coming down to our bit quite soon. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's going to be quite a big job. But there you go, that's progress for you. Don't they look good, these pants? I gotta say, they're just fantastic. I love them. I love them so much. And I don't, you know, go out of my way to, to you know, scour the internet to try and get every single number. I just wait until I come across them with my, uh, my, you know, my usual general travels, really. And uh, that seems to just do the trick. But I'm not at the stage where. I'm just trying to get just a handful. I need so many um, to, to try and, you know, I think to have all the pre ISBN pan books, you're looking at about two and a half thousand or 2,600, something like that. And I don't know how many we've seen here today. Perhaps one and a half thousand books, maybe a little bit more. Um, so I'm a long way off, shall we say. Um, but I don't mind, you know, I, I just collect them for fun. And I, the main runs, like the numbered series, and the early greats and the early pan giants they're the ones I tend to concentrate on and I've got pretty good runs of, of most of those now I certainly haven't got all the horror ones I'd like to get more of the pan book horror stories but I'm just not prepared to be paying mega money for those books and uh, they do seem to go for quite a, quite a price when they do turn up in nice condition and I do only want them in, uh, in nice shape really So, looks like just a couple more shells to do on this final bookcase, and then um, I can move the rest of the like the non-ISBN stuff around the corner to the waiting empty bookcase.
But I suppose as we sort of close in on the last sort of eight minutes or so, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I mean, I so said this is like the third shunting video that I've actually done. And although they're really long, and I think, well, who the hell's going to watch those? Um, I know people find it interesting, and I know you know if you if you're this far into it. Well, congratulations, and um, I hope you you have found it interesting and not not too boring because. Um, I know it's only me sorting out books ultimately at the end of the day, but um, I like to see other people's collections and this would be impossible to film in the studio. I have to film it in the library. You know, you're seeing the books in situ. This is how I store them. This is how I get access to them. And I think people do find that interesting and um, it may be much more than my rambling. So I hope that hasn't been too off-putting. <laughs> But yeah, if you have made it this far, well, well done. And and do leave a comment. I know you know the previous videos that I've done. I've done a couple of shunting videos, and they they're, they're all in the thousands of views. And I don't know if that's because people put them on to fall asleep. I don't mind, <laughs> but I think that's maybe what people do, or um, they end up they put them on, you know, drifting off to sleep, and they uh, they end up nodding off to them. Well, there you go. That's how it goes, isn't it? <laughs> So this is the tail end of the pan giants, the X ones. And then I move on to some of the uh, the other numbers and the M's. And then we've got the E's and the T's and the C's and some of the other ones. And um, the only difference really in the different series is, is what pan we're charging. So the different letter denotes the different cost that the books were going to be. That's the only sort of uh, differential that you need to know about. So about to move on to the M's, which is the uh, the Pan Majors, which was a different price point yet again, even more expensive than the uh, the number of the G's or the X's. But that's how they rolled, and it was a good system, I think. You know, um, I believe Corgi do something slightly similar with different numbering for different or number prefixes for different price points, but I'm still yet to sort out accurately um, how. Corgi have done it and I dearly dearly like a list so if anyone has got a Corgi list I'd be very very interested in that I mean apparently Richard Williams did one many years ago but I haven't been able to find a copy of it okay on to the uh, next to last bookcase and uh, this was uh, some of the other series at like the E's and the Pam Pipers and you know the T's so one of those really odd sorts of um, sorts of uh, series the tail end ones basically of the main pan run and once I've sorted those I have to take the balance around the corner to the empty bookcase so that's what we're going to do now so we're almost almost at the end of today's video which is um, good and bad really it's a bit of a long one and I appreciate um, you know not everyone wants to stay and watch three hours of book sorting But if you have, I do hope you found it interesting at least.
Yeah, the M books were sort of came sort of mid to late sixties. Uh, that was when they were sort of in their heyday. There's a few before that, of course. Um, you know, the fifties ones, which are really big, thick, massive majors. But um, they did have a little publishing boom, sort of in the late sixties. I guess it was just because of the, the the price point. But I like them, but they don't quite have the same. I think the, the most appeal is is the great pans for some reason. Um, when they started to be published, they really just sort of hit out of the park with their beautiful cover art right from the start, and uh, they're probably my favourite of all. But I think getting the numbered series is it was a real target, and uh, I certainly enjoyed tracking all those down. And uh, those are ones which I did try and pinpoint book by book off eBay and places like that just to finish the set. Although I definitely have a few upgrades that I'd love to uh, swap out on those, which are a bit on the rough side. So yeah, as, anyway, as we uh, hone in in the last couple of minutes of the video, um, I just want to say thank you very much for watching today. As I said, if you've made it this far, almost three hours, I think you deserve some sort of medal. Um, but I would imagine that anyone who is interested in this is probably going to watch it in chunks, you know, here or there, over a few days or a few weeks even. Um, and uh, if that's you, then that's absolutely fine. But do leave a comment if you if you like uh, this sort of stuff, or if you've got um, any questions about the collection. You know, I'm happy to answer them in any comments you might deem fit down below. Obviously, if you've not already, do please uh, subscribe to my channel and also my cleaning channel, if you wouldn't mind. If you'd like to see, um, you know, swathes of books being cleaned over a period of time, um, I release a new video on that channel once every Saturday. And uh, I mix it up, so I do large format books and I do uh, vintage paperbacks and I'm working my way through my pans and penguins. So obviously they're going to take you know ages to do but eventually my entire book collection of, will have been through the process so uh, do uh, do check that one out and subscribe over there as well but yeah there we are one final look of uh, the bookcase that we've just been working on and that's now given me all that extra space to uh, to go around the corner into the uh, into the brand new bookcase. So that's the pans looking groovy again, just how I like them. Excellent stuff. Got to love them. Got to love the pan books. And there they are. I've now got some room around the corner for the uh, the ISBN titles, and they're also now looking really good with a whole nother extra bookcase spare which I'm going to think I'm going to move my corgis over and that's still to do eventually <laughs> but yeah thank you very much for watching today and I'll see you again very soon with yet more book content bye